To some, he was the dandy doctor. Smith, Dr. John Smith. A man of gadgets and a whiz behind the wheel of many a sci-fi vehicle. To some, he was a cantankerous old scarecrow. Come on, Aunt Sally. To others, he was a chief petty officer. Everybody down! Or one of many characters whose voices appeared in homes around the world, drifting out of the wireless. To me, he was my dad. I'm Sean Pertwee, and this is a celebration of the broadcasting career of my pa, John Devon Roland Pertwee. Over the next hour, we'll hear rediscovered sound reels, previously unbroadcast interviews, and precious behind-the-scenes recordings. Welcome to the John Pertwee Files. My real name is Jean de Pertuis de Laiovo, but nobody pronounced the name Pertuis because it was spelled P-E-R-T-H-O-I-S, so the illiterate English pronounced it Pertuis. Uh, <laughs> so it was changed to P-E-R-T-W-E-E, and now they pronounce it Pee-wee, Petwit, Pardony, Pastwit, and anything else. <laughs> Born on July the 7th, 1919, my father was a rebellious child. Expelled from several schools, he later set his sights on life as an actor, but found himself politely asked to leave the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. With an unhappy home environment, a few prospects for work, it seemed like a life in the circus beckoned. I rode on the wall of death. What, on a motorbike? Yeah. I also had a rather straight... A man came to me one day and said, Here, John, you want to buy a lion? And I said, Well, what would I do with a lion? He said, Well, I've got a lion. He said, He's so old, he's got no teeth. And when he roars, he goes, Argh, and then shows his gums. He's not very frightening. He said, Perhaps you'd like to buy him and put him in the back of the baby Austin and ride him round the wall of death. <laughs> I said, Ride a lion round the water. He said, yes, yeah, a good idea. And he said, nobody else has done it. And so he did. And he, <laughs> yeah, and, he, and it was fine. And everybody loved it. Leo li liked it to a degree, but he died eventually of a heart attack. <laughs> Not surprising. An inauspicious career start, but the source of a fine anecdote. Away from the circus, it wasn't long before the young John Pertwee began to make his mark. John Pertwee is an artist who we believe has got a big future in radio. He has developed in the music hall as a top-line comedian, and we think he is potential material for a series of his own. I've had a talk with him the other day and asked him how willing he would be to make radio his first choice of career over a long term. The idea obviously appealed to him. That memo from early 1949 was by Michael Standing, the BBC head of Variety. It had taken a long time, but by then, John Pertwee was a household voice on the radio. The journey had begun more than a decade earlier. On the 25th of February, 1938, he was issued with his first official contract from the BBC. For the handsome sum of seven guineas, he was to play four parts in the classics-inspired drama Voyage of the Sun. The roles listed on his contract are Ludovico, Young Man, Voice One, and Icarus. Young John Pertwee had found his wings. The Radio Times loftily billed the programme as a survey of man's aspiration towards flight, an apt beginning. Later that month, and for the increased sum of 12 guineas and contractually agreed modest travelling expenses, he swapped ancient Greece for Northern Ireland. This is the national programme from Northern Ireland. At the BBC studios in Belfast, my father performed Lily Bolero, a drama about the 1688 siege of Derry. Tonight we present Lily Bolero, the story of the great siege of London Derry in prose and verse. Miraculously, a recording of this performance survives in the BBC archive. Here's John Pertwee performing live on the microphone at 8 o'clock on the evening of Wednesday, the 30th of March, 1938. He played two parts, the narrator and Colonel Richards, a diarist. Thursday the 20th. In the evening, the Major General came on board the Dartmouth, where I was posted, it being the advanced ship, to observe what the enemies did. My Lord Dungan and Colonel Carroll, two enemy officers on shore, sent off several times to compliment the Major General and told, among other things, that he might command any refreshments that were ashore, which, according to the accounts I have had, are but small. My father was just 18 years old when he made that appearance. That year, he continued to perform regularly in radio programmes, but not at the BBC. For if you want to while away the night or day, I simply take you in. 
Radio Luxembourg and Radio Normandy were the two biggest commercial stations in the United Kingdom. As part of their schedules, they produced a host of radio serials, pacey stories told in 15-minute installments, which were sold across the globe. These were the soap operas of their day, and it was a chance encounter that led to my father becoming a regular voice on them. I was walking down the street one day when I ran into an actor called John Salew, and John Salew said, you speak West Country, don't you? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, nip up to this studio in Bond Street. He said, go there, just say that I'm terribly sorry I can't turn up today because I'm filming, and I've sent you instead. And so I went up, and the producer was furious. He said, I don't just get people off the street. I said, no, as a matter of fact, I said, I can do the voice. He said, you can? I said, yes. He said, go on, do it. And so luckily, it was a West Country farmer. Roy, I said, that's no problem at all. He said, you got the job. I rushed back home, and I phoned my agent, and I said, Morris? He said, yes. And I said, I've got good news. He said, oh, yes. And I said, John Silu, I met in the street. He said, yes, I know. And I said, and, and he sent me there, and I've got the job. He said, yes, I know. And I said, well, what else do you know? He said, I know that you've got every other job Mr. Salou does there. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're doing Mr. Reader, you're doing Stella Dallas, you're doing Young Widow Jones, you're doing all of them. And you're paid two guineas a program. You're going to make a lot of money, young man. And I said, well, you don't sound very happy about this. He said, I'm not. And I said, why? He said, I handle John Salou as well. <laughs> The next couple of years were a boom time for my father. He found himself in steady demand across radio services. But then in 1939, the outbreak of war forced him to turn his attention away from acting. My father joined the Navy and became, in his words, very ordinary seaman Pertwee, PJX 178358. However, his radio roots never left him. His fellow Matalos quickly dubbed him Marmaduke. After his role on the radio soap, Marmaduke Brown. During his time at sea, Pa never gave up the hope of returning to his radio career. In one letter to the BBC, composed while on board HMS Valkyrie, he wrote, Last time I was on leave from sea a few months ago, you were good enough to arrange some broadcasts for me. Thus my leave was turned from idleness to great happiness. I shall be in town from January the 11th until the 22nd, and if during that time you could make use of a juve or a char, would you remember this request? I was a dialectician prior to the war. My father, a willing juve or char for hire. Those are juvenile or character parts, in case you were wondering. After a spell at Portsmouth Barracks, where he nearly lost his life during enemy bombing, my father found himself promoted to sub-lieutenant J.D.R. Pertwee of Special Branch and was dispatched to the Isle of Man, where he was assigned confidential duties. On the island, he formed an amateur company, performing a variety of shows to an appreciative local audience. A return to London followed, where he was seconded to the naval broadcasting section, which made programmes for all Her Majesty's armed services. The men and women serving around the Boer world, here's merry-go-round. Week by week, the show goes round the services, bringing music and fun to boys and girls in khaki and two shades of blue. This week, the predominating colour is once again navy blue. My father also played another vital role within that department, one that would offer a new direction for his broadcasting career. While I was there, I had to uh, check up on various people saying naughty things on radio. There was a show called Mediterranean Merigo around then with Eric Barker, and so I was sent along to check up on him. And when I was there, he said, I want somebody to shout out something from the audience. And I said, I'll do it. He said, what's your name? I said, Pertwee. He said, are you a member of the Pertree family? I said, yes. He said, oh, good, yeah, you can do it. And I had to shout out a line. He and his wife, Pearl Hackney, were arguing. And I had to say, oi, leave him alone. You're always picking on the poor perisher. And she's supposed to turn around and she say, who on earth is that? And Eric's supposed to look into the audience and say, oh, that's the Minister of Education. <laughs> now, that's precisely the kind of joke I was sent down there to stop him doing. <laughs> but I got an enormous laugh with it, and I was so proud. It was the first laugh I'd ever had. I'd been a straight actor before. I'd never done something from the audience, and I was thrilled. And so after the show, Eric said, very good. I enjoyed that. You did that well. He said, what, what were you here for? I said, well, I was a spy. I'm coming here to spy on you and report on you. He said, well, what sort of spy are you going to be? I said, terrible. <laughs> and he said, do you want to come back next week? I said, yes. And so John Pertwee became a regular on Merry-Go-Round, putting his inventive voices to use as a wide selection of characters. That top secret signal, is it's gone off the top of the safe. Oh, yes. Oh, it's all right. The messenger hadn't got a kettle holder. And what messenger? Why, Abel Seaman, John Pertwee. Hello? How about that kettle holder? Oh, what? That bit of paper? Oh, I just lit the fire with it out the back. But it was a top secret signal. 
Oh, well, you gave me quite a turn. I thought he was going to say it was a book of leave warrants. <laughs> he would remain with Eric Barker's troupe for the next five years. Good morning, Mr. Barker. Did I say morning? Oh, good morning, Mr. Fly. Did you say good? Certainly. Good and morning. Did I say in? Yes. Did I say... Please come in. Mind your head on the icicles. Too late. You know, it's very easy to remove icicles. The Lord of Trade doesn't ask the impossible. Did I say civil? Hey. <laughs> to move all the snow would be impracticable. Did I say bull? But after all, we are not a Gestapo. Did I say... Uh, how are you keeping? <laughs> Interviewed on BBC Radio's The Public Ear, my father offered some insights into what made his characters so successful. There's a rather interesting thing about voices, you know, that uh, a lot of dialects, a lot of voices come from positioning of mouths. If I thrust my jaw forward, so I underhang my lower jaw, immediately the voice changes. I'll give you an example. I'm going to throw my chin forward, now immediately I'm talking like that. And I'm not in any way altering my voice, but that is exactly how it comes out if you push your jaw underneath your top and top teeth, and that's how the voice comes out. I'm not putting on a voice at all. So therefore, if you position your face, different uh, sounds come out of it. That's why people talk, I think, in this ex these extraordinary ways, and therefore it has a reality. I've watched people who, who talk, and uh, I've watched characters, and this is usually what I've tried to sort of base my characters on, on this reality. Merry-go-round later transformed into waterlogged spa, where the naval base setting switched to a health spa to reflect the adjustment to post-war Britain. It was on this show that my father created his most popular radio character, the postman. Here are your letters, Bill, darling. Oh, I, they're, uh, they're last week's, so they're fairly fresh. Thank you, postman. Is, uh, is that a GPO uniform you're wearing this morning? The at here is salvaged from one of me old campaigns. When you were in the Bow Street Runners? Oh, no, my dear, I'd never run anywhere. No, no. <laughs> so this was when I were attached to the 97th Brigade de Foot. In the postal department, of course, my dear. <laughs> I were in Russia, you see. The officer, he come up to me one day and, and he says, Take your mail, bat postman, and right up there, he says, all through the valley of death. Cannons bullying and thundering the old time. And I hadn't got far before I said to myself, I said, Postman, I said, somebody's blundered. So I turned around, my dear, and I come back. You uh, still had your letters intact. But all that was left of them. All that was left of them? Oh, I, all that was left of them. Left of the 600. Oh, I feel... <laughs> so what does it matter what you do as long as you tear them up? No matter what. Oh. As with many of his outlandish characters, unlikely though it might seem, the postman was drawn from real life. Postman was an old man called Pa Curtis who delivered the mail. <laughs> he walked the equivalent of eight times around the world in his gum boots. <laughs> And you can imagine the condition of his feet. <laughs> and when, by the time he got to our house, he had about four pints of scrumpy. And he used to say, Goral, I ain't going up there. He said, I'm fed, I'm fed up with that. He said, let, 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 let um, them young brothers come down here and get it. He said, I, I ain't going up there. He said. <laughs> so my, then he'd take the letters and he'd throw them in the field, in all the mud. And my father said, God damn it. The damn man's done it again. <laughs> go on, lads, down you go and get the letters. And we used to get a penny. And that, that was he and Pa Curtis. And one day he got a bicycle. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to, going to ride a bike. I'm not going on delivering. I'm going to ride my bike. And he had a racing bike. Nobody knew why he had a racing bike, but he had handles that went down. And he had very big eyebrows. And one day he had a terrible accident. He said, oh, you never believe it. Oh, Pa Curtis was going up the hill. He said, pedaling away there. He said, and he bent down so low, he said, his eyebrows got caught in the front spokes and had him off in a trice. In 1947, he joined what was to become another long-running radio comedy, which once again gave him an opportunity to indulge his flair for quirky characters. Do you know what's in store for you for the next half an hour, ladies and gentlemen? Oh, you'll never guess. The... Up the pole! Up the Pole ran for four series and starred Jimmy Jewell and Ben Warris. And my father was a regular guest star. Watch your mate! Oh, Burpee. 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 Well, 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 Burpee. Fancy seeing you again. Yes. Where have you been doing all these months? Working? No, no, no. Only mugs work. Oh, I've been doing the old currency lock, you know, all the rhino. Oh, you mean in the bun factory? No, not that sort of currents. 
I mean the old do re me. Well, this sounds Danny, very interesting, you know, Mr. Burp. Did you, uh, did you do well? Oh, yes, I'll say I did. You did? First of all, I took me 35 pounds in English money over to France. Yes. And they gave me 40,000 French francs. Go on, then, go on, yes. Then I took me francs over to Holland, <laughs> and they gave me 10,000 Dutch guilders. <laughs> That's good. Yes, and I took me guilders to Russia. Did you? They gave me 50,000 roubles. Did they? Then I had away all my roubles. You know what they gave me when I got back to England? No, what? Six months. <laughs> <laughs> but others saw the potential in John Pertwee, beyond playing the second banana. My father was duly given his own series in which the postman became the lead of his own sitcom, Puffany Post Office, now running a village shop. Puffany Post Office, my dear old dear. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, how long did that last? Oh, it lasted about uh, three years, I think. I think it was that long. Mm. It would have gone on longer, but uh, I went off to Australia then. Um, I was asked to go and do, take the first Folie Bergère review title oh. show out to Australia, which I wanted to do, and mm. so I, I then left. Looking back through the cuttings, it's a shame to dig out old cuttings on these occasions, but I couldn't resist finding one critic of 1949 saying that my advice as a critic to John Pertwee is professionally not to be so greedy. He plays too many parts and does too much. If he can curb <laughs> a little of that and concentrate on one part, he can become as famous as the Colonel in Itmar. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I think you've got a little more famous even than the Colonel in Itmar. What, what do you think of that advice? Do you think that you, you overdid it in those days? No, you? not at all. This was the day of steam radio when people like myself, sort of multi-voice men, were very much in work. Uh, also, a lot of us were, were able to sort of spin it off and go into the music hall, which was then the all-important way of earning money. Now 30 in the lead of his own series, my father explained his philosophy for radio comedy in the pages of the Radio Times. It's my firm belief the Red Nose gag show is almost a thing of the past. I'd like to base the whole series on village life. There are quite enough sophisticated programs going to satisfy the town people, but as far as I know, there's never been a successful comedy show set in the country. In contrast to Pa's peppery wireless personas, Radio Time sounded absolutely smitten upon meeting the actor in the flesh. Whatever may have been the popular idea of Pertwee's appearance, most people were astonished when they beheld a tall, lean, good-looking young man, disconcertingly like Danny Kay, with fair hair and an athletic figure. My father duly returned the compliment, writing to the Radio Times to thank them for illustrating the article with his most flattering headshot. Although Puffany Post Office was short-lived, it was a rewarding experience for my father. In a letter to producer Mike Meehan, dated June of 1950, he said, Since the recordings are now complete, I would like to thank you most sincerely for all your help to me in the early stages. I do appreciate all that you did on my behalf. I was delighted and astonished our listening appreciation figure was 62, and I hope that this, to some extent, will make you feel justified in the great faith you showed in me. During the 1950s, my father made guest appearances on shows such as Workers' Playtime, Picture Parade, Midday Music Hall, Variety Playhouse, and The Forces Show. There are dozens upon dozens of contracts in his official BBC file. There's also a collection of letters offering his services to shows across BBC Radio, even Woman's Hour. He quite simply loved radio and was happiest when he was busy working. I used to do uh, anything up to 15 broadcasts a week. And they were all repeated, you know. We had, we had an enormous residuals, <laughs> which was wonderful. This is my father speaking to Simon Bates in 1992, recalling his hectic schedule dashing between radio studios. So you lived rather well in the 50s and 60s? Yes, very well. Yes, I remember once Val Parnell from the Palladium saying, why don't you come and do a Palladium uh, slot for me or do a summer show? And I said, are you mad? I said, because in the summer, all my programmes are repeated. So I get all the repeat money and I live in the south of France on my boat. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what life was like in those days? Well, pretty well, yes. I'm Sean Pertwee and you're listening to The John Pertwee Files, a celebration of my father's broadcasting career featuring rare material from the archives and rediscovered gems. In the late 1950s, the BBC was on the hunt for new ideas for a radio comedy series. My father met up with one of the senior managers at the corporation, and a comedy classic was born. Michael Standing, who was then the head of programmes for BBC, he sent for me and said he'd rather run out of ideas, and what did I have in mind? And so I told him, a new services show. And said, what service had you in mind? I said, well, the Royal Navy, because I was in the Royal Navy for six years. And so the Royal Navy it was. All right, all right, for Drake's sake, you'll get your money back. Well, get off. Well, get off, you perishers. Get out of it. Get out of it. 
Yeah. Well, I set Quentin Hogg on you. <laughs> Let go. Let go of me. Here, will you take luncheon vouchers? <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, there were so many servicemen, so many people who had been in the Merchant Navy and in the Royal Navy, that recognised the situations because we kept them as true as we possibly could. This was very largely helped, of course, by my cousin, who was then the commanding officer of HMS Truebridge, which is why we took the name and we called it Troutbridge. And he used to write to us and tell us of true things that had happened on board the boat, which a lot of people would not believe. I mean, on one particular occasion, they took a wrong turning and they started going up the Manchester Ship Canal. <laughs> which is the thing you can't very well do with a destroyer or with a frigate. Right, just coming into the dockyard now, sir. Wherever it is. What are you talking about? It's Portland. That's what you said at Plymouth, Gravesend and Fishguard. <laughs> the Navy Lark ran for an incredible 18 years and made household names of my father, Leslie Phillips and Richard Caldicott. A young Ronnie Barker was also soon noticed for his versatile contributions. During the 50s and 60s, my father was also busy trying to further his film career. His three appearances in Carry On films stand out as delightfully memorable cameos. And he also took on dozens of other cinema roles, including a 1953 stint doubling for Danny Kaye and acting opposite future Doctor Who William Hartnell in Will Any Gentleman? Mr. Henry Sterling. <laughs> I hope I'm not interrupting you. No, no. We were expecting you. Were you? <laughs> yes. Were we? Oh, I, I, I don't know. Meanwhile, post-war Britain was also slowly adjusting to a new form of broadcasting. Given his success on the radio in comedy, not to mention his distinctive looks, it was not surprising that the BBC were keen for John Pertwee to transfer his comedic skills to the small screen. One ambitious BBC TV proposal cast him as the lead in a sitcom in a period costume setting, decades before Up Pompeii and Blackadder. Sadly, this never got past the idea stage. A memo from Tom Sloan, the head of Light Entertainment, expressed serious concerns. Quite frankly, I do not think that this has a chance. Apart from the fact that costume comedy is bound to be expensive, I am sure that our success in this field has been based on the fact that viewers have been able to identify themselves with our various heroes or with the situations. Comedy writer John Law added, This is fairly abysmal if it's designed as an evening sitcom. It ploughs the same furrow as the valiant Varney's, except where Reg would hit somebody over the head to solve a problem, John leaps into bed with a serving wench. Clearly, the prospect of John Pertwee making merry with a maidservant was too much for Auntie Beebe's delicate sensibilities. The corporation later placed a broadcast ban on Pars LP Songs for Vulgar Boatmen, for good measure. He was a saucy fellow and he loved the ladies' looks. What's more, he had the kind of bait to catch them on his hook. So, a defining TV role would have to wait for now. But my father still managed to clock up plenty of television broadcasts in the meantime. I moved into television when it was on nine-inch screens. Uh, the first television series I did was in about 1946. It was called The, the, the Life and Adventures of Commander High Price. This was long before your time, but this was in the Eric Barker era where there was a character called Commander High Price, whose catchphrase was, Hush! Keep it dark! He was Commander High Price, late of the Secret Service, and he was, a, he was an old eccentric spy. And uh, we did a, a, a spin-off and did a, this on television. It was appalling. It was quite dreadful. Nobody saw it, but it didn't matter. We were paid very little money, but it gave us experience in front of the cameras. And in those days, of course, you had to work under batteries of lights that blazed down on you and you, you were absolutely exhausted after about 20 minutes and you were baked like being in an oven. The hard working conditions didn't put him off from pursuing more television roles. And in 1969 came a golden opportunity. One day when I was doing the Navy Lark, Kathy Goldstein said, why don't you put yourself up to Doctor Who? I hear Pat Troutman's leaving. So I rang my agent and I said, Richard, I said, I've got a very good idea. How about putting me up to play Doctor Who? And so he rang up and they said, we're gobsmacked. Our mouths are hanging open. We can't believe this. He said, why? He said, may we read you our short list that we've compiled 18 months ago? He said, yes. And they read it and my name was second on it. Now you're all dying to know who the first one was. <laughs> well, it was Ron Moody. Uh, he was going to do it, but he couldn't do it. And, and, and so I was lucky I got it. On the 20th of June 1969, 
the BBC issued an official press release. John Pertwee, actor and comedian, will be the new Doctor Who when the long-running serial returns to BBC One next January. It will be seen in colour for the first time. John's phenomenal range of accents and voices has earned him the title of The Man of a Thousand Voices. He has been for the last three years in the West End and on Broadway, starring in There's a Girl in My Soup and O'Clarence. Colourful, dynamic and ever so slightly camp, John Pertwee was the perfect Doctor Who for the early 1970s. Over the years, he gave many interviews about his time on the show and we've unearthed some rare treasures. During the early 70s, Vivian Berry presented a hospital radio show on Radio St. Helier, broadcast to patients of St. Helier Hospital in Surrey. She was granted a backstage audience with my father, who was busy at the Ashcroft Theatre. This recording hasn't been heard since 1974, and starts with him trying to answer Vivian's questions while shaving and getting into costume for his performance. Um, you are perhaps best known on television as uh, Doctor Who. Each of the Doctors has his own style uh, of acting the part. Do you choose a style, or are you told by a producer? Oh, not at all, no, no. The, the, uh, the producer or the heads of programmes, and Sean Sutton was the head of programmes, he and I had several, several lunch meetings with the producers after they decided that they'd like me to do it. And I asked them on many occasions, I said, well, look here, I don't sort of see this. How do you want me to play it? And they said, uh, as John Pertwee. And I said, well, what is John Pertwee? Because I don't know, because I've hidden under theatrically what we call a green umbrella. Rather like Peter Sellers does, he never plays himself, he always plays somebody else, and that's what I've done. So uh, it was very difficult for me as Doctor Who, because Doctor Who was basically a very straight role. So they said, no, play it as you, so I had to find out who I was, and then it all happened. Also in 1974, my father spoke to Peter Hunt on the BBC World Service, where he explained more about his characterisation of the Doctor. When you joined it, the image changed a bit and it became more adult. Was this your idea? This was my idea, yes. I didn't want to uh, go into the mass media solely for children. I hadn't uh, touched the mass media of television for a long time. I'd been worming my way back into the straight theatre for some seven years before that. And uh, I wanted to do something that would appeal to the mass public. So although I didn't want to take it away from the children, I wanted to get adult viewers. And we now have, I believe, about 60% adult viewers. And the rest of the rest of children, we have more adults watching it than children now. William Hartnell, who was the first Doctor Who, and, and Patrick Troughton, who was the second, were always sort of rather shambling sort of characters in the, in the Doctor Who. When you came, suddenly there was a great sartorial improvement. Was this something that you wanted to install? Yes, because I've always been uh, known, I think, as a, uh, as a natty dresser. <laughs> in fact, I once had the great honour of being on the list of one of the five best-dressed men in England. I was very proud of that, I remember. And uh, I thought this was, again, an opportunity of, uh, of getting a bit of glamour into the programme. And why look scruffy? Uh, if you can do the same job and, and have really beautiful clothes, why not? And it all started quite by accident. My producer said, put something on for a photographic session when, just when I'd been given the job. And uh, I found my grandfather's Inverness cape, which I'd always rather liked, which I used to wear at night sometimes for premieres. And I put on a blue velvet smoking jacket and a Mr. Fish crumply shirt, white frilly shirt and put this on and said, what about that then? More of as a joke than anything, and they said, that looks beautiful, we love it. As a child, I was an avid viewer of Doctor Who during my father's time on the show, and there were perks to being the Doctor's son. I got to go in the TARDIS, although it was a lot smaller on the inside, containing only a hammer and a hard hat, and my father would often bring props home for me. I was the proud owner of a giant maggot, Bok the gargoyle, a mutant head, a naught on hand, and the blue metabilis crystal although we later had to give that one back. The range of stories was fantastic, and my father was happy to play the hero, although he confessed that he rarely understood the show's complicated plots. One thing I've always wondered is whether you really understand the plot, because it's fiendishly complicated, <coughs> and I believe, to a scientist, the plot is quite Absolutely acceptable. Correct. You know, it has to correct. be. If we go into science and we go into it incorrectly, we're taken to task instantaneously by not adults, but by children. So if the programme is scientifically correct. But do you understand... No, I don't. No, I know exactly what you're saying. Do you understand all the time warps and all this sort Not of thing? Not at all. I haven't the faintest idea what I'm talking about half the time. In fact, you may have noticed that in the last year or a year and a half, they've become less scientific because I said, look, it, please, I don't agree with this. I think this is scientific claptrap. I think this is self-indulgent writing. It may be frightfully interesting for the writers and very interesting for the scientists, but for the general public, they don't know what I'm talking about. 
I don't know what I'm talking about, and if I don't know what I'm talking about, they're not going to know, because I'm not going to make a lot of sense out of it. In October 1971, the Doctor Who team travelled to Portsmouth to film The Sea Devils, featuring monsters that rose up from the English Channel wearing discarded fish netting, poised to take over the world. BBC Radio Solent's Henry Yelf caught up with my father, who had returned to the very naval barracks he was based at when he nearly lost his life during wartime. Yelf started by asking about the Doctor's latest adventure. Ah, well, that's a very difficult question being asked the plot, because I only just finished uh, Doctor Who yesterday. Um, uh, and we go from one story into another, and it's a little difficult. But um, the plot, more or less, is that this is an island, which is some 15 miles off the shore, this location, at an island which is occupied by the Navy. And um, the master, uh, Roger Delgado, uh, impersonating a naval officer, comes here to steal uh, certain transistorized equipment for his, for, for, for his foul and heinous use. Uh, the the threat, as always, we have a threat, as you know, uh, it, uh, uh, some form of reptilian monster, undersea monster, known in this story as the sea devils, and the master and the reptile sort of get together and he tries to use them for his foul deeds to assist him, and we then defeat them with the use of the Navy, up the Navy. I was with the Navy for six years, so I have strong feelings about the Navy winning in this story. Um, apart from that, that I do hear, that, that, whether it's true or not, I don't know, that when the Navy was asked permission for us to use this location, they said, oh, yes, of course you can use it, with the greatest of pleasure, as long as the Navy wins. <laughs> I see. What is it? One of the creatures that have been destroying the ships. You told me it was enemy agents. Why didn't you tell me the truth? If I had, would you have believed me? This was my barracks. This is well, my HQ. So you're coming home, or? So yes, indeed. I was uh, in the famous raid when uh, the barracks was very badly hit and G Block was blasted, and um, I was uh, sort of far watching at the time up in the attic of G Block, and a, a, a incendiary bomb fell through the roof, and they'd been shouting parachutists. We were expecting an invasion at the time, and uh, as soon as I heard this word parachutists, I wasn't very happy. And then they said, no, it's it's uh, magnetic mine bombs, you know, um, parachute bombs. And then there was a, a crash in the roof and in came an incendiary, which I tried to put out with a sandbag, but I unfortunately pushed it right through the ceiling and it fell in the hammock nettings and started a raging inferno. And I was halfway down the ladder on the way out when one of these landmines, parachute mines, hit the end of the Chiefs and Petty Officers block, the RPO's block, just opposite G block, and uh, blew the end of the building out, including mine, and sort of sucked me off the ladder and right out and dropped me in the, in the, the, sh the actual shell hole. And I was picked up by the rescue squad, who naturally assumed that I'd been in the building, and I had a sort of triangular-shaped head and looked very dead indeed, and they put me in the, the larder of the officer's mess opposite, uh, thinking that I was a corpse. And I came to about uh, three-quarters of an hour later and sort of turned round to ask what the hell was going on for my, my neighbours, who were also lying on slabs, but they unfortunately were very dead indeed, and I was very much alive. Sounds very much so, like a Doctor Who. Well, it does, but it's, it was, it was a, a true story, and I shouted and screamed, and, uh, and some, I said, hey, and when a fellow came in, I said, these people are all dead. He said, blimey, mate, I thought you was. And they hauled me off and took me to Hasler Hospital, where, remarkably, I was lying on my back, waiting attention when a, an angel flew down out of the sky with a red cross on her bosom, and she eventually got through to me. I was almost deaf from the blast, and said, she got through to me and said, what's your name? And when I told her, she burst into tears because it turned out to be a girlfriend of mine that I'd only left ten days before in London <laughs> who didn't even recognize me and so she nursed me through my hard time at that particular time. Although the third Doctor's era started out set mainly on Earth, the show soon ventured out to alien worlds, becoming more ambitious as time went on. One of my father's last Doctor Who stories even saw the special effects team tackle a dinosaur invasion of modern-day London. We've just done a program called Doctor Who and the Dinosaurs, in which we have dinosaurs, brontosauri, and Tyrannosaurus rex. And as soon as we put it on, and we called it a Tyrannosaurus rex, I had hundreds of letters from children saying, you're quite wrong, it isn't a Tyrannosaurus rex, it's an Allosaurus, because a Tyrannosaurus rex has got different leg shape front legs. Yours are much too long, and they've got three fingers, and an, a Tyrannosaurus had very short legs and only two fingers, and they were absolutely right. Fantastic. Yeah. I cross the void beyond the mind. During the invasion of the dinosaurs, my father was able to introduce a neat idea of his own, the Whomobile, the souped-up futuristic vehicle which he personally commissioned. It was a cross between a hovercraft, a plane, a racing car, and a stingray. 
he proudly introduced it to viewers on an edition of Blue Peter. There's a 1973 clip from Blue Peter, which is earth-shatteringly funny, and you introduced the Hoomobile. That's right. It's <laughs> a wonderful moment because everything looks so tacky, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but what do you think it looked tacky in the car? The car looks tacky. It's obviously some, you know, someone from from BBC has got behind and put a few lights on. Oh, but it wasn't. It, it, I, I assure you, it wasn't tacky at all. It was superbly put together. Oh, was it? Absolutely magnificent. It was the best looking thing you've ever seen in your life, and everything worked. I mean, all the things. The only thing that didn't work was the ejector seat. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, all those, the computer thing worked enough, you see, for photographically, yeah. so that you pressed the button and all the lights flashed. Well, it did work. Everything worked. Oh, I assumed it was just a put on job for. No, for it, 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 it did nearly 90 miles an hour. It was very, very fast. And it was designed by a man called Peter Farris in Nottingham. Mm -hmm. And somebody said to him, How can you, how many pieces? He said, Will I be able to make this in? And they said, Six at a minimum. So he said, All right, I'll do it in two, and did. And he did it in two mouldings, and it, it, it stopped the traffic wherever it went. We had to put it on a low loader eventually because people ran into each other when they <laughs> took a look at it because it looked like a hovercraft. The Hoomobile clocked up many a mile, ferrying my father to personal appearances. In fact, when I was with him, we were stopped several times by the police, who sheepishly admitted they just wanted to have a go. He also worked hard to publicise his work on Doctor Who, appearing on many other BBC shows. Pop score! Yeah! In 1974, he even had his knowledge of popular music tested. The common word for John Pertwee is who. Oh. Oh, oh very good. <laughs> Starting um, now. Who stole my heart away? One. Who sorry no? Two. Uh, uh, who is the doctor? Three. Uh, who can I turn to? Four. I wonder who's Kissinger now. Five. Um, uh, who wants to be a millionaire? Six. Uh, uh, who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Seven. Um, uh, who, 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 who do you think you're kidding, Mr. Hitler? Eight. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Who were you with last night? Nine. Uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, who, oh, 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 oh. Your time is up, uh, yeah. uh, John, but you're a very brave nine, I go far to say. They're giving a little applause. Oh. During those years, the Doctor battled aliens and an arch enemy, the Master, played with a devilish panache by his dear friend Roger Delgado. Aided by military task force unit, the Doctor also faced a menagerie of monsters, both new and old. Pa revealed to presenter Judy Spires the ones he liked and disliked most. Which was your favourite adversary? Oh dear, uh, I knew which weren't my favourites. I hated those sort of automatic things that had sink pumps and egg whisks and tennis <laughs> balls stuck all over them. I didn't like them, or that they couldn't go downstairs. The Daleks? The Daleks, You yeah. didn't like the Daleks? Oh no, not at all, no, no, idiotic things. Oh, right. Uh, but I, li I like the uh, the chaps that had uh, that showed their eyes and their mouths, like the draconians and the ogroms and those, the later yeah. monsters. I was rather partial to the giant spiders. Well, yes, you obviously were, uh, as opposed to Liz Sladen, who, who got into an absolute manic state of nerves at the very thought of even touching a mock spider. My father played the third Doctor for five series, bowing out in an epic story titled Planet of the Spiders. <laughs> Having traumatized a generation with giant maggots and a giant fly, giant spiders were probably only a matter of time. My father recalled co-star Elizabeth Slayton's unease around her eight-legged co-stars. So we trained her yeah. by having a little tiny spider. And we said, look, Liz, look, it's a spider. And she went, oh, because you've got anorectophobia. She said, I can't stand them. And so the next day we had a bigger one. And a bigger one up to the bench day after about a week. I had a great big one and I hung it on her back. And she went through horrors, but eventually she got to use, got Poor used to it. Oh, God, I know exactly how she feels. No, she hated them. Although my father often claimed to have left Doctor Who after failing to secure a pay rise, in truth, it was the end of an era. The close-knit team he'd enjoyed began to disperse, and it was time to move on. I had to face my, my fear, Sarah. While recording for Planet of the Spiders took place at TV Center, the secretary of the official Doctor Who fan club managed to secure a backstage interview. Has anybody stopped you and so will you say that you're, uh, you explain who you are, that you have permission from Barry and you're a party, all stick together and you know the rules, always stay behind the cameras. The recording is quite rough and at times you can hear the actors performing the Tibetan chanting in the studios next door, but it's a fascinating insight into the on-set atmosphere of his final Doctor Who story. My last two recordings are next. Uh, the, the, the next two to this lot, so that's in two weeks. I finish on May the 3rd. It's my 
last recording day, but I've already recorded the changeover between Tom Baker and I. We did that previously in order to help Tom out. Just how are you going to change all Is it just going to be the same as the... As the previous the one? No, not really. I go to face my fear. Um, the Remember I gave Katie... Joe Grant, the, the, the crystal from Metavidus 3. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, she sent it back to me. This is causing her a lot of problems up the Amazon and her expedition. And then it's nicked from me, and we find that, in fact, it is, mm -hmm. it, it is desired by the Great One, who is the sort of Queen of the Spiders, in fact. And it, I have to return it to the Great One, to Metavidus 3, and in doing so, I lose my present life. I die, but I go on forever being a Time Lord and... and uh, I'm taken over by, by Tom. This is my... Now how does the actual changeover occur? I mean, the effect, especially? The effect, well, it is done by lying Tom down alongside of me in exactly the same position, and then they, get, they take a picture of me, and then they overlap his camera, and then they say, move out a bit, move sideways a bit, until we're absolutely uh, overlapping. We have a little dying speech. Yeah. I'm off. Yeah. Look, Brigadier, look! I think it's starting. Well, here we go again. Of course, my father left Doctor Who, but Doctor Who never really left him. He was always willing to put on his frills and velvet for conventions and personal appearances, which took him all over the world right up until his death. But where did it all begin? In a modest church hall in Battersea, London, on the 6th of August in 1977, where the Doctor Who Appreciation Society held the show's very first fan convention. We'd like to welcome you to perhaps a rather unique event. It's the very first ever Doctor Who Appreciation Society, in fact, the very first Doctor Who convention. Despite its poor quality, you can hear the excitement of the assembled fans when my father took to the stage, brandishing his original TARDIS key. Yes, I've got, oh yes, I didn't tell uh, yes, uh, somebody spied it. That is the actual key of the TARDIS. At all. Uh, this is the one, that, uh, I think there were only three made. I pinched one. Um, there it is. Yeah, I'm going to get it out, boy. There. That's the TARDIS key. Uh, if you want to take pictures of it close to later. Now, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give this key to... Susan Moore. To Susan. Susan is a very good model, I'm told. And Excellent. She's going to do a, she's going to do a, 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 a casting of it and, and make some models of it so that you can all get them. Uh, but only one thing I beg of you storm, because I, sh I shouldn't have nicked it from the bee. <laughs> the following year, 1978, fans from the recently formed John Pertwee fan club were able to catch up with my father in his dressing room at Teddington Studios. He was hosting the hit ITV game show, Who Done It? This recording has never been broadcast before. I don't know whether this is recording or not. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> oh, is it recording? Well, now? I don't know. I just put it on. I mean, yes. just, you know, just, just let, it, let it go. Yeah. Well, the needle's moving, so presumably oh, that's all right. Good. Well, I've got a little something as well for you. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, how lovely. <laughs> <laughs> today. Oh, now, don't yes. laugh at them. <laughs> the fan club was keen to know if he would ever consider revisiting the Doctor. The answer is now that I very much doubt whether I would go back now. Um, mainly because I think that I don't really... Well, now I shouldn't say this. <laughs> I don't like no. the way Doctor Who is going. Yeah, at all. Well, the sets, I think, are very indifferent. They, they, I used to say, this is why, when I took it over, I said, I, look, let's make monsters come to Earth. I remember that simile I used to give yeah. you, said there's nothing more alarming than finding a it's yeti incredible. sitting on your loo and shooting back. Yeah. It was credible, because, that yes, was the point. This is yeah. the thing. Yeah. When you build fantastic caves and things, there's no good having a concrete floor with a cave being bumble, 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 yeah. then coming to yeah. a dead stop, dead yeah. 90 degree angle. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks silly. And they've done an awful lot of that, and I just don't like the way things have been going, you know. And if it's have you watched it then at all? Very seldom. So just the odd occasion. The odd occasion. I don't follow to see what's going on, and I haven't approved. I don't. I didn't like that character, that girl, and leathers wandering around. Yeah. According to the fan interviewers, there was a tantalising rumour that the BBC was planning a special Five Doctors story, uniting all Doctors and even introducing a brand new one. This apparently was news to John Pertwee. Is there any truth in that Five Doctors? Have they, have they confirmed? Have they Nothing. approached you at all? Nobody's approached me at all. Well, why the we, hell do they write an article? Think and were well, you were to write well, to them and ask what it was all about? April Fool's Hope, so. Well, but uh, wouldn't, wouldn't anybody from the Doctor Who office tell you? The thing to do is to get in touch with <laughs> the DW, mm -hmm. is to get in touch with the Doctor Who office and mm -hmm. say that you're inquiring through the Doctor Who Appreciation Society, which they do work fairly closely, yeah, 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 because yeah, they, yeah, I mean, they yeah. always come to you for information and so on. 
and say, come on, look here, we have this tremendous coverage. We, we want to know the truth. What is happening? Are you doing a five doctors? Because John Burton doesn't know anything about it. And what a fascinating me who the fifth is going to be, because Tom said that Doctor Who will die with him. It's the oh, that I've heard he no. said. No, no, no. He said when Doctor Who dies, when he goes, Doctor Who will finish. Some years later, the five Doctors finally became a reality, marking the 20th anniversary of Doctor Who in 1983. The third Doctor happily returned, to great acclaim. Doctor Who cemented my father's status as a cult figure, something he noted often with pride and occasional ambivalence. And his next major character would also mix broad appeal with the uncanny. But what role could possibly eclipse the good Doctor? Well, the answer to that stands to reason. Wurzel Gummidge was a passion project for my father. It was a welcome opportunity to reinvent himself, ditching the Doctor's frills for tattered sleeves stuffed with straw. The show's co-writer, Keith Waterhouse, once noted that my father played the scruffy scarecrow with all the sincerity of Hamlet, and it was quite true. He lived and he breathed the role. Filmed on location in the Hampshire countryside under the watchful eye of Academy Award-winning director James Hill, Wurzel was nominated for several BAFTAs and even saw John Pertwee named ITV's Television Personality of the Year. However, in the era of the professionals, picket lines and glam rock, the show's quaint stories weren't an easy sell to TV executives. When first approached by writing duo Keith Waterhouse and Willis Hall to play Wurzel in a film adaptation of the original Barbara Youth and Todd books, my father set his heart on the role. I was asked to do a film. I was asked to do a, a big, big picture by Keith Waterhouse and Willis Hall. They said, would you like to make a movie of Wurzel Gummidge? And of course, I'd read it as a book as a child, a, a Barbara Youth and Todd's books in the 30s. And it had been played on radio with uh, Norman Shelley and been enormously successful, and I loved the books, and I said, oh, God, yes, I'd love to. They remembered the character, the postman, they remembered this, this West Country character that I played, so they said, would you like to play it? Now, unfortunately, we couldn't get it off the ground. It was very sad. No money, we couldn't get the distribution, and so they abandoned it, and I said, please don't do that, write me a pilot. And they wrote me a very short pilot, so I gave it eventually to Lewis Rudd, who was a very perspicacious man uh, from Southern Television, and he said, oh, I think this is wonderful, it's magic. And we did it, and it took us 18 months to get it on the air. It was uh, certainly the, the greatest fun thing that I've ever been involved with. I, I loved it. Because you ran the gamut of emotions from A to Z in 25 minutes. And, and if you got stuck, you changed your head. <laughs> uh, which was an idea I had, because with, with the TARDIS, you see, you can go forward and back in time. And I thought, well, that's what we can do with Wurzel. He takes his head off and puts another head on, so he can be anything. Uh, from a, you can be a singing head, or a writing head, or a thinking head, or any guy, any guy, daft head. <laughs> and so it worked. My little home, where you and me is going to live up and ever after, after we're married. This place? You expect me, a genuine miogany odd Sally, to live here? Why, what's wrong with it? The wonderful Eunice Stubbs co-starred as the uppity Aunt Sally, a fairground wooden doll, ever appalled by Wurzel's dubious affections. It's a horrible, it's an awful dirty mess. The show was a hit, running from 1979 to 1981, spawning a gallery of merchandise, a sellout musical, and even the obligatory novelty record. And don't worry, we're not going to play it again. At the height of Wurzel's success, my father and Una visited 10 Downing Street in costume to meet the Prime Minister for a special children's charity event. And Wurzel didn't even have to wear his handsome head. Like the third Doctor, Wurzel was very much a public figure, visiting fates and making personal appearances across the country. One appearance saw my father at a local radio station in Hampshire, where he took calls from children. Have you got your thing in your head? Yes, do you want me to sing a song? Yes, please. Where be that Wurzel tree? Where, oh, where it be? It be up yum, chandon tree, I don't know, a man he be after he, with a dum dum. I've forgotten it. I was that go that words or tree. Well, the thing is, you've got your interviewing head on, haven't you? Oh, yeah, that's what it is. I ain't got my singing head on. Mm. What I wanted to ask you is, why doesn't anything ever grow in the field? Why doesn't nothing ever grow? Yeah. It does grow, don't it? I remember once 
a, a lovely magic growing, and there were flowers, and flowers all round me. Every program that I see, always on the field. Yeah, well, I tell you what it is, is that Farmer Braithwaite, he, he cuts the crops down very early. If he didn't, you wouldn't be able to see me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good question. I hadn't thought of that one. I haven't really got me proper thinking there, Doc. I think that maybe Rebecca's telling words aloft to a certain extent. Well, know. what she's saying is that I'm standing out there and I ain't doing nothing because there ain't no crops to scare crows away from us, but you're saying... Or letting it? the crows on the field too much, eh, Wurzel? Then there's no crop to gather in. Maybe all them crows at it because I weren't there often enough. But you should be there because then if you stay there for two or three weeks, the crops will grow, then you could go and call Aunt Sally. Hello. Hello, Wurzel. Good morning. Good morning. What, what can I do for you, Matthew? You know who used Cockney rhyming slang? Yeah. What was it when he said you had to clear out the Ginger and Fred? The oh. Ginger and Fred is a shed, and the Rory O'More is the door, and the Apples and Pears is the stairs, and the Trouble and Strife is your wife, and the God Forbids is the kids. <laughs> and the Foaming Deep's compost deep. <laughs> oh! Oh! Don't say that word. Wurzel, hedgerow, gummage. Be it known that because by your own admission you have decided not to scare crows anymore, you are herewith consigned to the compost heap. It's at this point that I must confess my own little contribution to the world of Wurzel. Having followed in my father's footsteps by getting expelled from virtually every school I went to, he gave me my first taste of television working on the set, first as a cable basher and then as a runner before being promoted to play an undertaker scarecrow for a day, escorting a condemned Wurzel to the compost heap. This was the only time that we ever actually acted together. Have a listen. Oh, Alas, my spooky scarecrow didn't get any lines, but I hope viewers appreciated my earnest gurning. However, I didn't heed my father's warning and couldn't keep the gurn up. After four series and an extended musical Christmas special, Southern Television lost their broadcast franchise and Wurzel was left without a TV home. My father hoped to revive the series in Ireland. Scripts were finalized and sets were built, but a week before filming was due to begin, a union dispute saw Wurzel's visit to the Emerald Isle abruptly cancelled. But all was not lost. A producer in the Southern Hemisphere spied an opportunity and the scripts were swiftly amended from Ireland to New Zealand, allowing Wurzel and Aunt Sally to make two more series down under. Bruce, is, is, is the hands come in. You take the box away. the box away, there's this dreadful face looking at us. <laughs> no, 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 we were rehearsing coming up, but it would now be revealed yeah. when he takes the box away. My father, in discussion with his trusted director, James Hill, while filming in New Zealand. A long and very happy partnership. While filming Wurzel Down Under, the crew also welcomed cameras behind the scenes where makeup artist Shane Radford was preparing my father for the cameras. We had to first of all make all the noses, which is the predominant feature on him. Uh, we made some up before he arrived over, but not having him to cast directly, we've had to make quite a few different types of noses for all these different head changes. Eyebrows, we had to make up some of those as well. The eyebrows are actually wheat with rubber backing, and the warts are honey puffs. Is that a sufficiently good plug, do you think, for us to get a packet or two? <laughs> His face is predominantly orange because it has to look like a Wurzel mangle, which is orange. It's ten minutes shorter than it took in England, and it's a damn sight better makeup. In 1993, my father tried to reinvent Wurzel as an animated offering using claymation. A pilot was made and then lost for 25 years, left forgotten in a dusty can on the garage shelf in the animator's home in Devon. The pilot soundtrack is unique, capturing the last time my father acted alongside Eunice Stubbs. Wurzel and Aunt Sally's relationship hadn't mellowed over time. Who said you could sit here next to me? Oh, come on, Aunt Sally. You know I loves you, don't you, Anne? I just wants to make you happy. You're dirty and smelly and you've got straw all over. Oh, go on, Aunt Sally. Marry me. Won't, won't, won't. Besides, I'm engaged to a streamy superior person. No, oh, no, you bain't. You're engaged to me. As they entered their senior years, many of my father's old colleagues had found success in more heavyweight roles. His old Navy Lark co-star, Leslie Phillips, had, for example, started working for the Royal Shakespeare Company. And in fact, I worked with him on a show called Chancer. 
This was a source of some frustration for my father, as he was keen to tackle new challenges and broaden his range, but found himself pigeonholed by younger casting directors. Undeterred, he studied Michael Caine's famous acting lectures and began to relearn his screen technique. See the phantoms filling the sky around you. In 1992, pa returned to the stage for his last major theatre part, playing Marley in the musical Scrooge, alongside Anthony Newley in the title role. If you think life is miserable now, and the life to come... Marley's set piece was a splendid ghostly musical number, performed while aloft, 20 feet hanging from a wire. Not bad for a man who'd recently turned 73. For the next life is far, far worse. While the roles slowed down in my father's final years, the 1990s saw him keeping extremely busy, revisiting Doctor Who in a variety of formats. Doctor Who and the Ghosts of Endspace, starring John Pertwee as the Doctor. My father's last broadcast interview was in early 1996. He was promoting his latest Doctor Who radio series, and you can hear the pride in his voice when discussing his busy schedule. After a few lean years, John Pertwee was back in demand with a tour of his one-man show, and his diary was full again. John, it's been a joy to speak to you. Lovely um, to talk to you. And come back again soon. I want, I want some more anecdotes. I will. I'll be delighted. And John, don't forget, come and see my one-man show when it's going. Uh, when, when's it starting? Oh, now. I'm, I'm going all over the country now doing the one-man show, and I do another show uh, with music and an orchestra and a choir and puppets. So a bit of a quiet time for you, then? Uh, very. Yeah. Yeah. John Pertwee, thank you thank very you much. Thank you very much for having me. Bye. On the 19th of May, 1996, my father was holidaying with my mother in Sherman, Connecticut, at Richard and Lucy Nielsen's. I'm told they had a blissful Sunday walk, they swam in the lake, and enjoyed a long visit from friends, making plans for a return trip later in the year. He died that night in his sleep, aged 76. Watch! As I split the basic atom note, my fingers barely move enough to see. In fact, I draw the line across the leaf. Believe me, your puzzled faces wonder why. The sleight of hand deceives the eye. Your mystery, just for you, will I have a talent to amuse. Papa was cremated at Putney Vale Crematorium. As per his wishes, a Wurzel doll was attached to his coffin. When the casket disappeared behind the curtains, the toy scarecrow tumbled to the floor. He should have known that Wurzel rarely failed to disrupt a gathering. One mourner noted, as John for you, always playing it for the laughs. For an actor who'd sometimes worried that he concentrated too much on light entertainment at the expense of serious drama, it was a characteristic farewell. Pure mystery, just for you will I the talent to amuse you. You've been listening to The John Pertwee Files. The programme was presented by Sean Pertwee and produced by Richard Latto and Stuart Manning. Special thanks to Mark Braxton, Gordon Roxburgh, Stephen Griffiths and Keith Miller. The studio manager was James Luff. You can listen again to The John Pertwee Files on BBC Sounds. Well, that was rather marvellous. Next week at this time, from 2018, Harriet Gilbert talks to Sarah Waters about her novel Tipping the Velvet with readers from around the world. Celebrating 20 years since its first publication, Tipping the Velvet is a body historical lesbian romance following the startling career of Nan King, oyster girl from Whitstable, turned music hall star, turned rent boy. It'll be a lively discussion in World Book Club next week. We asked our survey, what did you do that your parents disapproved?